This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello, this is Hallie Alexander from Wake Forest University, and I'm here with Wyatt Benskin from Case Western Reserve University. Wyatt has an interesting background in epidemiology and health disparities research, and he recently published a paper in neurology where he and his colleagues used Medicaid claims data to evaluate racial and ethnic differences in anti-seizure medication prescribing in people with epilepsy. Wyatt, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So can we start by you summarize your main findings from the paper? So in our study, we use Medicaid claims data, and we had just over 78,000 individuals spread across 15 different states that were included in these data. And so what we did was we identified a whole host of covariates, including comorbidities, state of residence, and then also looked at the generation of anti-seizure medication that individuals were on, as well as their adherence. And so these Medicaid claims data are certainly a crude measure of clinical care delivery, but nonetheless, that sample size, again, of just over 78,000 and really helps paint a population health level picture of these trends in anti-seizure medication use. Right. And we all know that the newer generation of anti-seizure medications have less side effects in a lot of people, maybe better tolerated and lead to better adherence. And so that's why it's important to pay attention to what generation of anti-seizure medications are being prescribed for which populations. And what do you think some of the drivers were for these inequities? You said that a lot of the non-white populations were less likely to be on the newer generation anti-seizure medications. So what do you think is contributing to that? You know, one limitation of these data is we didn't have the ability to understand the mechanism of these differences. But reviewing the literature and thinking as a team critically about this, there's a lot of drivers of this, whether it be a, a provider, a health system, or a patient level. And so everything from affordability of medications to trust between a patient and their provider, there's ample literature out there that highlights racial and ethnic concordance between providers often will improve outcomes. So whether that be a provider not understanding the the circumstances of a patient's life or a patient not feeling comfortable disclosing side effects or uh, poor seizure control. Ultimately, though, we think it's a real combination of all of these factors and and the nature and privilege and power of the healthcare system versus um, these minoritized communities that contributes to the differences that we observed. And now you used Medicaid claims data, so that means that insurance coverage was not a factor in these prescribing practices. But was there any way that you took into account the type of epilepsy that the patient had and the specific anti-seizure medications that were used in order to account for some of these analyses? For example, I'm thinking, you know, maybe if the patient had a generalized epilepsy, it's possible that some of the older generations, such as valproate, could have been the preferred choice. So did you look at any of those extra factors? Unfortunately, we weren't able to. Claims data are kind of notoriously bad in identifying really specific subtypes of, of seizures and epilepsy. And so that's certainly, I think, a next step is understanding why these patterns emerged. You know, and I do want to highlight that we had just under 80,000 folks in the data that we used. So these were population level patterns. And so understanding, again, some of those drivers of uh, epilepsy type, seizure type, seizure frequency, things that claims data aren't always powerful to capture, I think is a a wonderful next step for this line of research. And what about next steps, not necessarily in terms of the research itself, but what do we do in terms of action? So what are next steps to help actually reduce racial and ethnic disparities in epilepsy? I think sometimes it's hard when we do these kind of large claims-based studies to think about what that means for the the practicing neurologist or epileptologist. And there's a few things that emerged from this that I want to highlight. I think the first is that we did see that folks who saw a neurologist were on newer medications more frequently than folks who didn't see a neurologist. So thinking of ways that we could expand access to high-quality neurologic care advances such as telehealth and telemedicine, I think have done a great job, but continuing to identify where those gaps in access to care exist at the structural level are important. At the health system level, I think that what we did in this paper, the analyses provides a framework to undertake a health equity quality improvement initiative to look at, you know, within a practice, um, within a neurology practice, what 
what patients are being prescribed, what anti-seizure medications, are there gaps that exist, looking at things like insurance coverage, primary payer that we weren't able to do. And then I think at the provider level, just thinking about your own practice with patients and how these aspects of racial concordance and trust come into play. Uh, You know, the reality is in the United States, racism is unavoidable and permeates all aspects of our life and certainly the healthcare system. So just awareness of these differences and taking a pause and kind of evaluating both the structural healthcare system and provider level factors is at least a, a, a big undertaking, but a decent next step. Yeah, a lot of work needs to be done here, but I'm glad you brought up both the systems level changes that we can start looking into and then also on an individual level, things that we can do. So what is one thing you would say that we could take with us into the clinic today to help us check our own prescribing practices and make sure that as an individual that we're doing everything we can to try to address these inequities? The biggest takeaway I would say for that practice level is being aware that these individual level interactions and patient care bubble up to these population level differences that we observe. And so recognizing that even a positive clinical encounter has the hue of racial concordance. Only just under 3% of the neurology workforce is Black or African American compared to 20% of our sample and, and about 14%. I believe, of the United States. And so thinking about how those factors come into that closed-door office visit, they're unavoidable. And so recognizing them and addressing them with patients and among colleagues, I think, is a really important immediate step. Yeah, there was a good example in the paper where you mentioned that African Americans may have more mistrust of the medical community, and so they may be less likely to bring up side effects to their doctor. And so it can lead to this whole cycle. So that's one thing, you know, that I did take note of in the paper is maybe just being a little bit more explicit about asking clearly about side effects for all people and not just saying, oh, are you having any side effects from your medication? But asking this can look like, you know, X, Y, Z. Are you experiencing any of this? If so, we can work with you to find a different medication with the goal of being seizure-free and side effect free. So thank you for those points. Absolutely. It really touches on an important issue, which is that the power that the healthcare system has is massive. And unfortunately, the healthcare system, as we know it today, has a long history of really atrocious acts towards minoritized communities. And so that's the system that we operate in. And I think it's important to recognize that our paper wasn't trying to place the blame on individual providers, but rather recognizing that the healthcare system is a powerful structure and has taken power away from these these individuals over time. And so exactly like you just said, right, is recognizing that that's the system we operate in and taking a pause and being more specific about the questions that are asked or thinking about those social drivers of health that might play into both access to medications and then subsequent adherence, I think, are really important steps. Thank you so much. Again, I've been speaking with Dr. Wyatt Benskin about his recent publication in Neurology, which is titled Racial and Ethnic Differences in Anti-Seizure Medications Among People with Epilepsy on Medicaid, A Case of Inequities. You can find the full article in the February 7th issue of Neurology or online at neurology.org. Wyatt, thanks again for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please Take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about. The views and opinions of the participants in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the journal Neurology or the AAN. Disclosures of the participants are included in the show descriptions reached by a link on the neurology.org website.